So, welcome everybody. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension. Uh, and on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin. Did you notice they changed their name on Monday? And the Wisconsin Alumni Association and the UW Madison Science Alliance. Thanks again for coming here. We do Wednesday night at the lab every Wednesday night 50 times a year. And tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome back to Wednesday Night at the Lab, Tom Givnish. He's a professor of botany here. He was born in Philadelphia and went to LaSalle College High School in Philadelphia. Then he went to Princeton to get his undergraduate degree in math. He stayed at Princeton to get his PhD in, um, in biology, biology. <laughs> biology, the study of bile. And then he went and was on the faculty at Harvard for seven years, and then in 1985 came here to UW-Madison. Uh, he's one of the most widely traveled researchers I know of. Um, there are four letters that come to mind. I-M-N-V-S. <laughs> no, wait a minute, that's five. Okay, so, thanks for pointing it out. I had my hand out there, yes. Uh, so... This is going to be pretty cool. He's going to talk to us tonight about the drivers of megadiversity in the orchids, the largest family of flowering plants. Would you please join me in welcoming Tom Givnish back to Wednesday Night the Lab. Thanks so much, Tom, for that gracious introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here uh, again, and I hope you'll find that this talk is worth your uh, travel out in the snowy weather. Orchids have long had an outsized impact on human culture, natural biological diversity, and the intersection of both. Culturally, over the centuries, orchids have come to symbolize elegance, beauty, strength, love, and sexuality. Some 2,500 years ago, the great teacher and philosopher Confucius admired the way that many mountain orchids in China lived in the trees as epiphytes. Quote, the orchid grows where others cannot, enduring the hardships of hunger and thirst, and is only loosely tied to the things that support it. And yet, with all the difficulty of its life, the orchid graces the world with beautiful color and rare fragrance. This is like the life of the true noble who sets himself to learn self-discipline and whose character shines no matter where he is or what he experiences. In Greek mythology, the demigod Orcus became drunk at a feast of Dionysius and attacked a priestess. The gods tore him to pieces, and everywhere a different bit of orchis fell, a different orchid sprouted, and one of them had a pair of tubercles below ground resembling testicles. Indeed, orchis is classic Greek uh, for testicle. Many European orchids, like this one, have such tubercles. According to the ancient doctrine of signatures, the popular but completely wrong uh, idea that eating a plant that resembles a human organ uh, can cure afflictions of that organ, orchid uh, tubercles uh, came to be seen as aphrodisiacs. The supposed tie of orchids to fertility uh, resurfaced in the Renaissance, most famously in the great tapestry Captivity of the Unicorn, where among the riot of flowers uh, surrounding the unicorn are several, several symbols of fertility, including uh, the uh, orchid by his flank, uh, thistles, and pomegranates dripping red seeds on his neck and, and back. At the same time, uh, a different fascination with orchids developed uh, in uh, the New World. The Totonic Indians near present-day Veracruz on the Mexican coast discovered that seed pods of vanilla vines uh, became highly fragrant as they dried and fermented and could be made into a delicious favoring for hot chocolatel. The Aztecs soon conquered the Totonics and extracted a yearly tribute of vanilla and cacao beans. In 1519, this led the Emperor Montezuma to serve the conquistador Hernando Cortez a vanilla-laced drink of the gods, just before Cortez turned on him and conquered the Aztec Empire. So beware to whom you serve hot chocolate. Vanilla and chocolate uh, promptly made their way to Europe, always used together. In 1602, Hugh Morgan, apothecary to Queen Elizabeth, realized that vanilla could be used as a flavoring by itself 
uh, which stimulated a rapid rise in its popularity. A century later, the French invented vanilla ice cream, which spread rapidly to England and its colonies. Thomas Jefferson became enthralled by vanilla ice cream in France and helped spread uh, the dish in the New World and uh, uh, pr uh, often uh, served it at the uh, White House. In 1793, the French smuggled a sole vanilla vine uh, from Mexico to the island of La Réunion uh, in Madagascar uh, in the Indian Ocean. And within a few years, uh, it um, uh, uh, was also spread to um, Tahiti and Madagascar. So vanilla soon became one of the most popular um, and expensive flavor commodities in the world, second only to saffron in price. But it was not until uh, 1893 that vanilla reached its most perfect form uh, as the centerpiece of that most sublime uh, confection, the root beer float. <laughs> to, today, uh, unfortunately, 99% of the uh, vanilla flavoring we use is produced artificially and not by the orchids. Full-blown orchid fever, uh, or orchid delirium, if you want, uh, broke out in the early 19th century, starting in England and then spreading across Europe and the Americas and ultimately to Asia and Australia. William Swainson, a plant hunter working in Brazil, sent several sterile epiphytic orchids back to England as packing material for other exotic plants. When his crates uh, arrived in 1818, William Catley grew some of Swainson's plants, and by the end of the year, they produced several large and striking flowers, which created a huge sensation in the gardening world. John Lindley, the father of more modern uh, orchidology, named them Catalea labiata, and that was the beginning. Uh, a mania for exotic tropical orchids soon seized many British aristocrats. In 1826, the Duke of Devonshire, the sixth Duke of Devonshire, laid eyes on Odsidium uh, papilio and was never quite the same anymore. Uh, he had his head gardener design and build the greatest heated conservatory of the day, 220 feet long, uh, 120 feet wide, and 35 feet high, heated by seven miles of steam pipes and lit by some 12,000 lamps when Queen Victoria visited in her carriage uh, down the middle aisle. It was here that the Duke, uh, the greatest of all the Victorian orchid enthusiasts, pursued his fanatic interest in orchids for the rest of his life. It did not take long for this exotic and expensive hobby to become popular among the rich, and soon commercial nurseries and individual patrons uh, sent orchid hunters to scour rainforests uh, around the world for new species to meet uh, the rapidly growing demand. Many plants rapidly died uh, until the growers uh, learned more about orchid culture and especially about how to germinate their tiny seeds. Make it many orchid collectors also died due to tropical diseases and wild animals and hostile natives and sometimes competitors. In 1901, uh, a group of eight men entered the rainforest of the Philippines. One was eaten by a tiger, uh, another uh, burned to death, and five more were never seen again. Uh, the sole survivor returned with 7,000 live plants and became rich. William Arnold drowned in the Orinoco River. Gustavo Vallas died of malaria and yellow fever in Colombia. An expedition of orchid hunters to Papua New Guinea were captured by the locals, and two were beheaded before the Indonesians sent in troops to rescue the others. At the height of the orchid fever, the prices for the most desirable specimens soared up to $1,000 per plant, which is then a prodigious sum. To prevent such prices from driving orchids to extinction, today all orchids are excluded from, uh, all orchid species, I should say, uh, are excluded from international trade under Appendix 2 of the CITES Treaty. Uh, however, a small but fanatical set of smugglers continues to operate outside the law. In 2002, James Kovach found an extraordinary and uh, extraordinarily valuable slipper orchid 
in Peru with huge purple flowers. He smuggled it back to the US where he worked with scientists at the Selby Botanical Gardens to describe it. Phragmopedium covachii here became the most desired orchid of the decade with black market specimens selling for $25,000 a pop. This caught the attention, as you might imagine, of the Peruvian government and the US authorities who uh, promptly brought criminal charges against all involved and a notorious scandal ensued. Now poaching remains uh, a danger uh, with orchids, but with the CITES treatment, treaty, pardon me, habitat destruction is a much greater threat to most species. At the same time, legal global trade in orchids grown for cut flowers and ornamental plants and vanilla and other flavorings now exceeds $2 billion a year. So whether we sip vanilla milkshakes or root beer floats, wear orchid corsages to formal dances, enjoy uh, orchid blooms at flower shows, stalk native orchids in bogs, forests or prairies, or like uh, Nero Wolf uh, atop his fictional New York brownstone, grow exotic tropical orchids in greenhouses, all of us partake in one way or another of the pleasure and diversity of orchids. Now, however great this cultural impact of orchids, their significance as a leading component of biological diversity in the natural world is even uh, greater. Orchids are the largest family of flowering plants with over 750 genera and 29,000 species. They're more diverse than birds, mammals, and reptiles combined, and they grow in a wide range of habitats on every continent except for Antarctica. Essentially, all temperate orchids are terrestrial, they're ground dwelling, but most orchids inhabit tropical forests, and over 80% of those are epiphytic and adapted for growth on tree trunks, branches, and twigs. Orchids display extraordinary floral diversity and sexual selection run rampant, with species showing remarkable adaptations to individual pollinators, and with different orchid species often using the same pollinator without hybridizing via precise placement of pollen pockets, or so-called pollinia, on different parts of a pollinator's body. Plant ecologists, evolutionists, and ecologists have long puzzled over why orchids are so diverse and how their diversity is related to their defining morphological traits. The wide range of habitats they occupy, their reproductive biology, their interactions with other species, and their history of geographic spread across the planet. Tonight, I'm going to uh, try to uh, answer each of these questions based on studies by orchid biologists over the past several decades and on research that my colleagues and I have conducted over the past few years. So first, what is an orchid? The family Orchidaceae is one of 77 families of monocots, all of which bear a single cotyledon or seed leaf, and they usually bear adult leaves with parallel venation and flowers uh, in three parts with three petals, three sepals, three stamens, and one to three pistils. Pollen is released from the stamens and uh, pollen arrives on the stigmas, uh, which are the receptive surfaces at the end of the pistils, where pollen grains germinate and grow down uh, the styles to the flower's ovary, fertilizing the ovules and then producing seeds. Orchids differ, however, from uh, all other monocots and indeed all their flowering plants in possessing a combination of four defining characteristics. First, a labellum or lip, uh, which is an enlarged, specialized, often colorful lower petal that serves as a landing platform or attractant for pollinators. A column uh, on which the, both the male anthers and a single female stigma are born in the center of a bilaterally a symmetric flower, that's a flower that is mirror symmetric. Uh, tiny seeds, each composed of an embryo of just a few cells and lacking endosperm in which food reserves are stored in other plants. And finally, mycoheterotrophic germination in which fungal infection is required for seeds to begin development and during which the seedlings depend entirely on fungi, not photosynthesis, for energy. Labellum size, shape, posture, and color varies tremendously among orchids and can help 
precisely position an approaching pollinator relative to the column, facilitating a high degree of specialization on individual pollinators. Tiny seeds and mycoheterotrophic germination are co-adapted in that small seed size allows a plant to produce and disperse very large numbers of wind dispersed seeds over long distances, which might be required to find just the right fungal partner. Conversely, um, seedlings from just a few initial cells uh, may require energetic input from uh, their fungal partners. Tiny seeds can also be seen as a pre-adaptation for what came later, namely epiphytism, uh, which requires, lest we forget, the ability of a plant's seeds to land and stay on uh, vertical uh, branches, trunks, or, or twigs. Now what distinguishes orchids from other plants ecologically? Orchids are remarkable for the large number of species that are epiphytic, for having exceptionally strong mycorrhizal associations with mutualistic fungi, for the many lineages that be have become wholly mycoheterotrophic, and for displaying an extraordinary diversity of adaptations for pollinators, including extreme specialization on individual pollinators and the widespread use of deceit to attract pollinators without any material reward. Nearly 80% of uh, all orchid species are uh, epiphytic, and orchids have more epiphytic species than any other plant family. One of the biggest challenges facing epiphytes is the uh, near or complete lack of soil on their perches. Epiphytes thus face a conundrum. How do they absorb water, and thus nutrients, without losing water from uh, the very live roots required to absorb water in the first place? Terrestrial plants dodge this problem uh, because soil prevents any significant uh, evaporation from the roots. Epiphytic orchids have solved the problem by developing a spongy layer of cells called the velamen around the live roots. During wet periods, the air spaces in the velamen fill uh, and the roots absorb water and nutrients. As the uh, velamen uh, dries, the air spaces drain um, and form a vapor lock, preventing almost uh, all diffusion of water vapor from the roots to the outside air. The velamen thus acts as a one-way valve, letting water into the roots during wet periods and then preventing uh, water loss during dry periods. So the velamen is a key adaptation that helps orchids survive and compete successfully as epiphytes. It turns out that other families that have large numbers of epiphytes like bromeliads or aroids have independently evolved other kinds of one-way valves to solve this problem. Orchids have exceptionally strong mycorrhizal associations with mutualistic fungi. These mycorrhizae help obtain mineral nutrients and especially slow diffusing phosphorus from the substrate. In addition, mycorrhizal fungi feed carbon to the non-photosynthetic orchid seedlings and are essential for seed germination and early growth. Now most orchids later become green and photosynthetic, <coughs> but about 250 uh, species are mycoheterotrophic throughout their lives. They never grow up. They're Peter Pan orchids, if you will. They've all gone over to the dark side, uh, obtaining energy from fungi, not photosynthesis. This transition appears to have occurred at least 30 times. The great frequency of uh, this shift most likely reflects the fact that all orchids are mycoheterotrophic initially, and so have the genetic uh, programming on board to uh, feed on fungi. The most extreme mycoheterotroph is Rhizanthella, the underground orchid from Western Australia, which lives its entire life underground and flowers just below the soil surface, attracting termites and gnats as pollinators. Most lifelong mycoheterotrophs are found in densely shaded habitats where giving up photosynthesis doesn't entail much of an energetic loss. Several green orchids may obtain some carbon from fungi later in life, but it is not known how much or what the fungi might possibly get out of such an apparently one-sided relationship. Finally, uh, orchids are best known for displaying uh, an extraordinary range of adaptations for pollination. 
Widespread interest uh, in this topic traces to Charles Darwin, who published a landmark book on orchid pollination in 1862, just three years after On the Origin of Species appeared. After Darwin moved to Down House outside London in 1841, he and his family frequently walked in the surrounding areas. He was especially fond of a location he called Orcus Bank, in which many native orchids grew in profusion under the trees or over chalk uh, limestone in open grassy areas. Darwin read Christian Sprengel's uh, German book on the natural fertilization of flowers, and it set him to thinking about how the strange structure of many orchid flowers might represent adaptations to attract animals to move pollen from plant to plant. What began uh, as recreation quickly became a mania, uh, as Darwin corresponded far and wide with gardeners and botanists seeking observations on native and exotic orchids. As his enthusiasm mounted, he wrote to his uh, close friend, Joseph Hooker, director of Kew Gardens, that you, quote, cannot conceive how the orchids have delighted me, that, quote, the orchids have been splendid sport, and that, quote, the contrivances of orchids beat, I think, any animal, close quote. And then he wrote to orchid expert John Lindley that, quote, orchids have interested me more than anything, uh, almost anything, pardon me, in my life. Coming from Darwin, that's really saying quite a lot. Through observations and experiments, Darwin showed that bees visiting orchid flowers land on the labellum and become precisely aligned uh, as a result of that with the pollen masses or pollinia and with the stigma on the floral column. By the way, pollinia, the pollen packets, each carry enough pollen grains to fertilize thousands to indeed millions of seeds uh, produced by a single flower. Then Darwin found more remarkably that the sticky feet of the pollinia became glued to the backs of bees, or pencils in his experiments, as they forced their way into the nectar-bearing gullet uh, of the flowers, and then pulled out. Several minutes have to elapse before the pollinia dry and then twist uh, into shape so that when an insect or a pencil returns uh, to a flower of the same species, the pollinia then and only then uh, can contact the stigma and fertilize the flower. This contrivance, as Darwin termed it, guarantees that a plant will not self if the time required to twist exceeds the time a pollinator spends visiting flowers on a given plant. Such a delay would allow a plant to gain all the advantages that grew from outcrossing as opposed to selfing. The pollinators, of course, benefit from sipping, sipping nectar while visiting the orchid flowers, at least in Darwin's view. Recently, uh, Peter and Johnson confirmed Darwin's outcrossing idea by showing that uh, over uh, a, a large number of orchids, the time required for the pollinia to twist and become capable of fertilization did, in fact, exceed uh, the visitation time and basically increased uh, uh, with uh, the length of time spent visiting an inflorescence. Now, bees, moths, and butterflies were among the pollinators that Darwin observed, with pollinia glued repeatedly and precisely to specific points on their backs, on their proboscis, or on their eyes, guaranteeing after the pollinia twist uh, that they're in the right position and thus can fertilize the orchids in question. These studies uh, are widely viewed as having laid the groundwork uh, for research on coevolution between different groups of organisms, which is a hot area of research today, and involves reciprocal selective pressures imposed by plants, uh, and their herbivores and pollinators on each other, or by hosts and their pathogens on each other, or by predators and their prey on each other. Darwin found that orchids pollinated by moths and butterflies have long nectar spurs uh, that fit the unfurled length of the proboscis of their pollinator. He argued that competition among orchids for pollinators would select for greater nectar rewards and therefore longer spurs, and that would result 
in butterflies and moths evolving longer and longer tongues to reach uh, those uh, rewards. Based on the uh, discovery uh, in Madagascar of a remarkable orchid, Angricum sescopedale, with a um, nectar spur up to uh, 18 inches in length, uh, pale flowers, and a strong scent emitted at night, Darwin predicted that someone someday would find a gigantic moth with a proboscis more than a foot long uh, that pollinated it. Uh, that prediction, of course, seemed quite outlandish, but um, just such a moth was first discovered in 1903 in Madagascar, though it was only demonstrated to pollinate Angricum sesquipedale uh, in 2011, over 146 years after Darwin had made his prediction uh, that this moth, aptly named Xanthopan morganii predicta, uh, existed. In recent years, two closely related species of Angricum, with much smaller flowers, native to the small island of La Réunion, remember with the vanilla uh, vines uh, imported there, uh, which lies 500 miles east of, uh, of Madagascar, have been shown to be pollinated by small nectar-eating birds known as uh, white eyes. And another species with even smaller flowers is pollinated by crickets, which is a global first. Uh, yet another close relative of Darwin's orchid, the uh, ghost orchid from South Florida, the famous star of the orchid thief, is pollinated by the fig hawk moth and related species. All of them have uh, long proboscis. Now, orchids can provide rewards other than nectar. We now know that many uh, South American orchids are pollinated by uh, male euglossian bees, so-called orchid bees, with these gorgeous colors in many cases. The euglossian bee males are drawn to orchid flowers to gather fragrances, which they then stuff uh, into little hollow pockets on their legs, and they make into perfumes to attract their own mates. Small chemical changes in such fragrances might attract different euglossian bee species, leading to reproductive isolation and perhaps rapid rates of orchid speciation. Now, or uh, Darwin did miss two really big things about orchid pollination, uh, as well as lots of little things. Um, first, ironically, he did not understand uh, that uh, species in several orchid lineages have rapidly evolved flowers adapted to different pollinators. The first demonstration of this came from my student uh, Jeff Hapeman's research on the largest orchid genus in North America, Platanthra, which has several species native to Wisconsin. Based on the family tree for this group that Jeff estimated from DNA variation and the pollinators of present-day species, he inferred uh, that ancestral Platanthra uh, were pollinated by uh, nocturnal moths that settled onto uh, the flowers, not hovered, and that from this ancestral condition evolved pollination by day-flying flies, bees, and butterflies, day and night-flying hovering moths, the hawk moths, and even by mosquitoes. Um, so second, Darwin did not believe and therefore did not follow up Sprengel's claim that some orchids use deceit to attract pollinators. Today, we estimate that one third of all orchids use deceit, not rewards, to attract pollinators. One example is our native uh, pink lady slipper. The labellum is lobed and conspicuously veined. Bees are attracted uh, by that pattern and a nectar-like scent, um, and then they, they land on the labellum and push through the veined opening, which you can see there, to access the nectar. Oh, and then they find out there's no nectar inside whatsoever. Uh, and furthermore, they're surrounded by slick, waxy walls that uh, prevent them from gaining any purchase to, to escape. In time, though, each bee, or most bees at least, uh, will uh, find and then climb up a line of hairs in the back of the pouch. Uh, and then uh, to get out, they first have to squeeze under the stigma. So if they're carrying pollen from a previously visited orchid, they cross-pollinate that plant. And then they have to squeeze under the anthers uh, and get pollen put on them to go to uh, the next uh, uh, plant if they uh, make uh, the same uh, stupid uh, uh, mistake. Orchids use three kinds of deceit. 
involving apparent promises of food, of oviposition sites, or of mates. The pink lady slipper provides an excellent example of generalized uh, food deception. Several other orchids involve mimicry of specific food providing uh, species. So here on the right, uh, Bisa pulchra from South Africa with no nectar is a remarkably precise mimic of uh, the gladioles relative Watsonia uh, lepida that grows in the same habitat and which provides abundant nectar. Epidendrum rad uh, radicans, rather common plant in disturbed sites in the New World tropics. It appears to mimic rather precisely the nectar-bearing tropical milkweed uh, with which it frequently uh, co-occurs. Oviposition sites, and I don't know uh, if we should turn the lights down a little bit here. Um, I guess I can't do that. Uh, occur in, in several groups, including the genus Dracula, uh, in which many species bear blood red or black petals and a lip that looks like a gilled mushroom, as you see here in Dracula vampira. Dracula flowers emit a mushroom-like scent that attracts fruit flies that lay their eggs on mushrooms. And a recent study used 3D printing of artificial flowers, combined or not, with scents produced by real flowers to show that both scent and visual cues are needed to attract uh, the fruit flies. In some Masdevallia orchids in South America, a foul scent, reddish color, and pulpy petal texture uh, attract flies that are seeking carcasses on which to lay their eggs. Uh, and then the flies uh, carry pollinia, and you can see one of them bearing pollinia here, uh, to the next flower of that species. Now one of the first convincing cases of mate deceit pollination, or sexual deception, involved bee orchids of the genus Ophrys, often found in chalk grasslands in Europe. Each species has a labellum, or lip, that visually mimics females of a local bee species. The flowers emerge before the females do and emit the same chemical they do to attract males. Because females mate but once, the males are strongly selected to emerge before them, and then many are fooled by the scent and the appearance of the bee orchids uh, before uh, any bee females are, are present. The males uh, land on the labellum, they attempt to mate with a seeming female, um, and uh, ultimately uh, have pollinia attached to them, and then they wind up transferring those to other plants. It's easy to see how slight visual or uh, chemical uh, changes in this pseudo-copulation uh, syndrome uh, could recruit different pollinators, quickly causing reproductive isolation from the parental population and in short order lead to orchid speciation. Variants of pseudocopulation occur in many orchid groups, especially in Australia. Uh, the Australian tongue orchids lure male dupe wasps, aptly named, uh, using a chemical similar uh, to a female's own sex pheromones. In this case, the males actually go all the way. Uh, and then they get uh, uh, pollinia attached to their abdomens in the process, which they wind up then transferring uh, to other uh, uh, orchids of the same species. Naivete is key. Uh, as male wasps uh, become experienced with real females, the ability of the tongue orchids to deceive males declines rapidly. Perhaps the uh, most uh, remarkable case of male deceit and pseudocopulation uh, occurs, uh, let me just see here, I just want to make sure that we have this off here, um, occurs uh, in uh, the uh, famous uh, hammer orchid of uh, the um, um, uh, Western Australia. After fires uh, sweep through uh, its scrub habitat, the orchid Can you turn the, uh, mic back on? Uh, produces a single basal leaf and a strange flower uh, atop uh, a, a tall stem. You've got to turn your mic back on. Oh, I do? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So as you can see from this photograph, the labellum or lip is uh, dark, uh, and it's elongate and knobby, and attached uh, via a hinge to the rest of the flower, including the stigma and pollinia on the column opposite the labellum. 
This strange orchid is pollinated by male finid wasps. The females are wingless and they live underground for most of their lives, coming uh, to surface uh, just after the hammer orchid blooms. After it emerges, each female will climb atop a plant and emit a sex pheromone to attract males. A winged male, hot on the scent and eager to mate, having uh, emerged a week or two uh, before the females, carries her off uh, to copulate, after which she'll be dropped off and burrow underground to lay eggs. Now, it could be chance uh, that the orchid flowers, uh, while the females are still underground, but it's beyond chance that the flower mimics the size, the shape, uh, the color of the female, and even gives off her scent. And this precisely when there are lots of sex-starved males around. The hinge joint, uh, the correct length uh, of, of the arm, uh, a glistening stigma with two yellow pollinia uh, held at exactly the right distance from the dummy, dummy wasp. Everything is perfect for an extraordinary coupling of wasp with flower. The male approaches, deceived, he tries to fly off with her, but succeeds only in catapulting himself repeatedly into the orchid's column and put in, pivoting with the fake female on the flower's hinge. At last, you'll see his back peels off the sticky pollinia, uh, and uh, he tears himself away. It's a bit of a struggle. Now, the male may visit other flowers uh, as the pollinia twist and dry uh, and become ready to fertilize another hammer orchid. But for this deception to work, the male must visit another hammer orchid, bringing pollinia and tens of thousands of pollen grains to a receptive stigma. When the pollen cr uh, is crushed uh, into the stigma, as you see here, the orchid is fertilized and gets to reproduce. Now let's turn to the main event. Why are there uh, so many uh, species of orchids? The orchid family contains roughly 750 genera and 29,000 species, divided into five subfamilies, the Apostasioidae, Vanilloidae, Cypripedioidae, Orchidoidae, and Epidendroidae. Uh, epidendroids include roughly 80% of all orchids, and most of them are tropical epiphytes. Orchidoids include uh, most of the remaining species, and most of them are temperate and terrestrial. Only orchidoids and epidendroids have discrete pollinia. Over the years, several factors have been proposed as drivers of the extraordinary diversity of orchids, including uh, the evolution of pollinia, specialization on individual pollinators, pollination via deceit, or euglossian bees, or lepidoptera, epiphytism per se, or associated traits like cam photosynthesis, and distribution in the tropics, especially in extensive cordilleras. Tests of these and other evolutionary hypotheses, uh, including historical biogeography, have long been stymied uh, by uh, the uh, lack of a fully resolved backbone phylogeny for the orchids. Resolving uh, relationships within the subfamily Epidendroidae, including 80% of the orchid species, has proven particularly problematic. So to clarify orchid phylogeny and test theories about the impact of various traits on diversification, my colleagues and I amassed data uh, for uh, some 75 chloroplast genes from 39 species representing all the subfamilies and most of the tribes, as well as 100 uh, out, uh, outgroup taxa, that's a uh, monocots and, and dicots outside of the orchids. We use maximum likelihood to uh, estimate a fully resolved orchid phylogeny, with two-thirds of the nodes having strong statistical uh, uh, bootstrap support greater than 97%. This plastome tree uh, clarifies broad-scale relationships within the family at several levels and resolves relationships among almost all tribes of the epidendroids. To produce a more comprehensive uh, phylogeny or family tree of the orchids, we conducted a super matrix analysis in which we added 140, 144 uh, species represented only by three sequences, uh, not the whole raft of, of genes we had uh, done for the others. And we calibrated this 
uh, super matrix tree against time using 17 angiosperm fossils. The result, which is summarized uh, on the right, is a fully resolved time calibrated tree for the orchids and clearly is a big advance in terms of resolution and also in terms of timing uh, over the previous view of orchid phylogeny shown on the left. Orchids appear to have diverged from their closest monocot relatives 112 million years ago, when today's northern and southern continents formed two great land masses, Laurasia and Gondwana, and Tyrannosaurs roamed a warmer earth. Today's lineages began to diverge from each other about 90 million years ago. The two largest subfamilies, the Orchidoids and the Epidendroids, diverged from each other about 65 million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous, just about the time that an asteroid struck uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and drove the dinosaurs and many other groups extinct. The epiphytic epidendroid tribes diverged rapidly from each other between 38 and 31 million years ago as tropical climates cooled and the central Andes uplifted. Based on this family tree, we found three significant uh, accelerations of net species diversification within the orchids. One, shown uh, near the bottom uh, in light blue uh, at the base of the orchidoids, the second in green uh, in, at the base of the upper epidendroids, and the last in red in the pleurothalids and their allies uh, in the Andes. Warmer colors indicate higher rates of net species diversification, the difference between speciation and extinction. The heights of the triangles are proportional to the estimated number of species in each clade or lineage. We overlaid traits thought to uh, influence diversification on the tree and then used a computer program to test whether they were correlated with speciation and extinction rates um, or with increased net diversification within lineages or with increased net diversification across lineages via added origins or losses of the trait in question. Uh, now this table looks like a, a bit of a, a, a disaster to follow, but the main column we want to look at is the, the, the zeta column, the mid column there. Uh, lambda one and lambda zero are speciation rates estimated with and without the character state in question. Mu one and mu zero are the corresponding extinction rates. Zeta is the estimated advantage in net diversification uh, per million years within linea lineages conferred by a character state. And keep in mind that that compounds. So if it's an advantage of 5% in 1 million years, it'd be an advantage of about 10.5% in, in 2 million years, and so on uh, down uh, the line. Um, Q01 and Q10 are the rates at which the focal character state is gained and lost. Uh, and then G, uh, at the end there, is the estimated advantage in net diversification across lineages conferred by a trait. Now, it might seem, as I said, that we're getting into the deep weeds here, but in what I'm about to summarize about uh, our, our results, you can concentrate on just one column, the, the zeta column uh, in the middle, the estimated advantage in net diversification per million years within lineages conferred by a particular uh, character state. Now, the evolution of pollinia significantly increased speciation and extinction and resulted in a 5% advantage in net diversification per million years within lineages. We hypothesized that pollinia should accelerate speciation by facilitating uh, specialization on individual pollinators or parts thereof. Pollinia may also allow small numbers of variants within population to produce lots of offspring, promoting speciation from small numerical bases that might otherwise lead to uh, demographic collapse and extinction. Epiphytism <clears throat> significantly accelerated uh, both speciation and extinction relative to terrestrial habit, yielding an 8.8% advantage in net diversification per million years within lineages. Epiphytism is most common in tropical montane forests where humidity and rainfall are high, temperatures are cool, and evaporation rates are low. Epiphytism is a key innovation by other vascular plants, and so should increase diversification. Epiphytism should also help generate and maintain high diversity because it's associated with highly dissected montane habitats. Also because variation in sunlight and humidity within tree crowns uh, permits local niche partitioning by uh, coexisting species, and because altitudinal 
and topographic variation across mountainsides could be partitioned at larger scales. Tropical distributions appeared to accelerate speciation and extinction, but this difference appears driven mainly by growth form, not by latitude per se. We found that terrestrial lineages in and outside the tropics had essentially identical diversification rates, while tropical epiphytic lineages diversified 2.3 times faster. CAM photosynthesis, in which uh, the stomata open and CO2 is fixed at night, reducing water loss at the expense of greatly reduced photosynthesis, accelerated speciation and extinction, uh, and yielded a large advantage in net diversification, um, a smaller disadvantage uh, across lineages. In orchids, it turns out CAM is very closely coupled to epiphytism. Deceit pollination, via mimicry of food sources, nesting sites, or potential mates, is nearly restricted to orchids. It significantly increased speciation and extinction, but surprisingly resulted in little overall change in net diversification. Pollination by male euglossian bees increased net diversification by 3.6% overall. Euglossian pollination might accelerate speciation by allowing small chemical changes in fragrances to attract different bee species and creating reproductive barriers. Pollination by Lepidoptera doubled speciation and extinction rates within lineages and resulted in a 6.9% acceleration of net diversification per million years. Pollination by uh, moths or butterflies involves nectar presentation in uh, corollas or nectar spurs whose length might rapidly evolve and lead to rapid recruitment or indeed rapid evolution of new pollinators, enhancing diversity. Life in extensive tropical cordilleras, and specifically, we looked at the floras of the Andes and the New Guinea highlands, significantly increased speciation and extinction, and yielded a large 25% advantage in net diversification within lineages, but also, apparently, a large disadvantage uh, across lineages. But the latter is illusory because most lineages never got uh, into, onto uh, tropical mountains. Extensive tropical cordilleras thus appear to have had the strongest <coughs> overall effect on net diversification in orchids. Now we've shown that uh, orchids are remarkably species rich, uh, partly as a result of three accelerations of net diversification. Our data provide the first quantitative support for several hypotheses regarding the genesis of orchid diversity and identify specific points in orchid evolution where these um, factors played a role. They show that multiple factors, some of them interconnected, have contributed to orchid diversification. The uh, first significant uh, acceleration of net diversification is at the base of the orchidoids, one node above where pollinia evolved. The second acceleration coincides with the origin of epiphytism in the upper epidendroids and the rise of several uh, montane clades. A deceleration uh, within the upper epidendroids, shown in dark blue and highlighted with that gold box, uh, reflects the rise of a group of temperate terrestrials and lowland epiphytes. And the final acceleration uh, in the tribe Epidendrii coincides with a large concentration of Andean species pollinated by deceit or lepidopterans. Plurothalids, the most diverse part of this clade, are largely pollinated by fl flies, lured by deceit. Low diversification rates characterize the lower epidendroids, which are terrestrial and mostly lack pollination uh, via deceit uh, or euglossines or lepidoptera. Overall, our results show that epiphytism and life in extensive tropical cordilleras, as well as pollination by lepidoptera and euglossine bees have had large effects on orchid diversification. The defining characteristics of orchids, the tiny seas, the mycoheterotrophic germination, uh, the floral column and, and labellum, um, yeah. did not accelerate diversification by themselves, but may have facilitated uh, diversification caused by subsequent evolution uh, of pollinia and epiphytism. Now, traits and habitat had important impacts on orchid diversification. What about biogeographic history? Our uh, biogeographic reconstruction implies that the orchids arose on the Australian plates, 
uh, 112 million years ago. Soon after, they apparently dispersed overland via Antarctica to South America while all three continents were joined and Antarctica supported tropical vegetation. Thus, while Antarctica is the one continent where orchids do not now occur, it appears to have played a key role in their evo early evolution. Despite their tiny dust-like seeds, orchids appear to have successfully undergone long-distance dispersal between biogeographic regions and continents less than once every million years on average. Furthermore, 97% of all orchid species appear to be restricted to individual regions. This suggests that slow geographic spread and then speciation in parallel in different regions and on different continents has played an important role in overall orchid diversification. Over the last 48 million years within the epidendroids, uh, the highest net rates of diversification occurred in the Neotropics and on the Australian plate, and specifically in New Guinea. And then uh, with the Neotropics serving as the most important source area and topographically complex Southeast Asia as the most important target area. But even this is not the whole story. Based on uh, previous research uh, by my group, uh, several factors uh, implicated in orchid uh, diversification also help generate the high diversity of bromeliads in South America. Yet there are nearly eight times as many species of orchids as bromeliads. Why? Four factors might help account for this difference. First, uh, dispersal time and familiar range. The dust-like seeds of orchids, their greater cold tolerance and a much greater time since initial diversification, 90 million years versus 23 for bromeliads, almost surely led to greater orchid diversity by permitting them to spread to every continent uh, and most latitudes while bromeliads have remained bottled up mainly in tropical and subtropical America. <coughs> Second, karyotypic evolution. It's often overlooked in orchids, yet many large genera show extensive variation in chromosome number. Pollinia and tiny seeds allow recovery from repeated population bottlenecks in orchids. Uh, such bottlenecks could fix uh, karyotypic mutants, changes in chromosome number. Uh, via drift and, and quickly create post-mating barriers and lead to rapid speciation. Third, limited dispersal of pollinators. Uh, the evolution of dozens of closely related Tegia species over only a few kilometers in Andean Ecuador and more generally the rapid geographic turnover of epiphytic species with distance in the Andes are both consistent with gene flow over only short distances in tropical montane areas. More research is needed to determine whether this might reflect limited dispersal ability of the small, soft body desiccation and tolerant flies that pollinate these species. And this moment, uh, Kelsey Hoosman, a uh, student of my colleague Ken Cameron in the UW Department of Botany, is in Ecuador studying uh, this group. Finally, uh, greater species packing. Across 17 neotropical uh, forests surveyed by Kreft and colleagues, epiphytic orchids had 5.6 times as many species within stands as bromeliads, and more geographic turnover from one site to another. Higher levels of local diversity suggest that community assembly in orchids may involve a finer or more extensive partitioning of pollinators or perches than uh, in bromeliads. So these uh, possibilities all call for new research on orchid community assembly, on montane uh, dipterin pollinators, on spatial scales of gene flow in orchids and their pollinators. Finally, I believe it's fitting to uh, end this talk on the drivers of orchid diversification with Darwin's conclusion to the origin of species. That great book sought to account for the diversity of all of life and concludes with a reference, unrecognized by most, including professional evolutionary biologists, to Darwin's beloved Orcus Bank, where he spent so many pleasant and productive days studying the pollination of orchids the most diverse family of flowering plants. So it is interesting to contemplate an entangled bank clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing in the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth. And to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other and dependent on each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by laws acting around us. These laws leading to a struggle for life and as a consequence to natural selection. Um, there is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having originally uh, been breathed into a few forms or into one 
And now, whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Happy to take questions. And to, to actually see you, I'm going to have to move out of the headlights here. No, yes. Darwin. Yes. Uh, why doesn't Darwin's plant work get more shrift? You pointed out this remarkable 1863 orchid book. You just ended with this, where he's talking about plants. Most people think. I, I, I suppose uh, we botanists need to sing it from the rooftops a lot more. Uh, certainly, in, in, uh, among plant biologists, it's well known. And um, when you uh, look at the whole collection of books that Darwin published, a very large number of them involve plants, whether it's pollination of flowers generally, uh, the orchids, uh, the nature of climbing uh, plants, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, quite a few applications of the idea of evolution were you know, uh, about plants. Uh, he, he, he focused on them. He, he found it uh, easy to experiment with them. Uh, and uh, also with the carnivorous plants. Right? He, he and his son Francis did uh, a large number of illuminating experiments. And I'm glad you're using the EX word because He was both. He was both a great uh, synthesizer, great idea person, uh, but also um, when it came to it, he, he was quite happy also to do experiments, or if not to do experiments, to ferret out the minute details that were required. What he didn't have, of course, was DNA. And that was a, a problem for two reasons. One was that uh, without having discrete basis for genetics, uh, he uh, came open late in life to the criticism that if inheritance is blending, if uh, sons and daughters are sort of just an average of the parental traits, that all variation would get blended away and natural selection would have nothing to operate on. And then secondly, uh, you know, it was only recently that we've been able to come up with uh, rigorously uh, uh, um, defined phylogenies or family trees based on DNA variation. Uh, and so, uh, you know, if, if only he had known about DNA, he could have gotten a lot further. Other questions? Yes? What is the protocol that you used to uh, build that complex spreadsheet, you know, all the different Greek uh, variables? That you oh, okay. So there, um, fortunately, I didn't do the programming. Uh, it's a program called BISI, uh, which um, uh, basically uh, takes the phylogeny, the, the pattern of branching, and therefore... Um, so the relationships of inferred ancestors to present-day species. And uh, it looks at the rate at which speciation has occurred, you know, the, how, how rapidly different parts of the trees have branched, and then ties it to uh, traits in present-day species, and then you infer what the traits of the ancestors were from the tree and, and the present-day uh, traits. And so it's elaborate, and, and that, that's the basis for um, uh, the calculations. Does that answer your question? Yes? When you say orchids developed 112 million years ago on the Australian plate, how do you know that? What, what's the evidence? Where do you, where do you right, so uh, how do we know that, in fact? Uh, so what we did was to um, basically, again, take the tree uh, and uh, to go back in time, right? We did a little time travel. This is the tree. Uh, so it's quite large, as you can see nearly 200 species in it, uh, representing almost all the tribes and the subtribes. And uh, you might not be able to see from here, but you've got all these boxes, right? Those are the geographic distributions of species in that genus or, or that particular species. And uh, again, using the uh, relationships among present day species and the present day distributions of the of, of, of those species, you can map back in time what the likely distribution of the ancestors were. So if you look at these uh, various uh, kinds of uh, circles, these pie diagrams here, uh, you can see uh, that uh, almost all of these plants here have got green uh, uh, pies. You know, the, uh, the, all the wedges are green. And if you look up at the top, the inset map, that indicates that um, the, the, the group appears to, those ancestors appear to have been present in the Neotropics in South America. And so uh, we, we 
infer the ancestral distribution this way, and then of course you tally up um, uh, where, where additional dispersal events have, uh, have occurred. So you know, here you've got some groups that have moved out of South America uh, to some other continents. So you do that some across the whole tree. Now, we've only looked at 200 species, and there are 29,000. There's clearly uh, the ability to work on a great deal more. This work, which was published around three years ago, would not have been possible five years before that because of the great increase in sequencing uh, efficiency. Uh, what we'd like to do is have several thousand species uh, in the analysis. Uh, and that might be possible in another five or 10 years. But for now, we're not planning to do that for orchids for a while. My colleagues and I, however, are about to submit a proposal working on bromeliads where we hope to sequence 3,000 species. So it'll be an order of magnitude uh, uh, increase in, in sampling. Other questions? Yes, sorry. Oh, well, bromeliads are pretty interesting. That's one reason. Um, and um, uh, they're, they're actually harder to sequence than the orchids. They're, uh, there's not as much stuff. There's, uh, there's a whole lot of cellulose in, in, in bromeliads, uh, so they're harder to get the DNA out. But um, they're more interesting physiologically. Uh, and so we're interested in, in how uh, the diversification of that group is tied not to pollination biology, but instead to um, uh, all different kinds of physiological adaptations, whether it's epiphytism or forming tanks in which rainwater accumulates, sometimes evolution of carnivory or nitrogen fixation, uh, things like that. Yes? Is it the immunological diversification of the species that drives such a large quantity, or is it its adaptiveness that seems to be driving the, the size of the species? The, the number of species, right? Um, yeah, the number. Okay, yeah. Exactly. Well, I, I wouldn't want to, you know, I, I wouldn't want to put my life on the line here in terms of uh, putting a bet on one versus the other. Uh, I think in general, uh, if you want to demonstrate adaptation, you either have to show convergence, you know, that, that uh, different species, different lineages, doing similar things ecologically, show similar phenotypes, show similar flowers, let's say, or similar photosynthetic pathways. Or you have to go in and demonstrate you know, that this variation increases the fitness of a, a particular group, it increases the survival rate or the, the rate of reproduction. Um, it is entirely possible, um, in general, I'm just stepping back as a general statement and then I'll come back to orchids. It's entirely possible that purely non-adaptive features can uh, trigger massive uh, speciation. So you know, Darwin said, on the origin of species, blah, 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 by means of natural selection. You know, there are some traits that may have very little impact on fitness, on, on the ability to survive and compete successfully, but lead to lots of speciation. Uh, the classic case involves poor dispersal. Poor dispersal. So in bromeliads, um, one group that uh, I studied has evolved more different ways of getting mineral nutrients than any other genus of flowering plants. They've got carnivores and nitrogen fixa fixers, and uh, they are uh, ant-fed in, in, in some cases, and uh, uh, so on and so forth. But there are only 20 species. There's another genus in the same area of South America, in, in the Guyana Highlands, um, which it, they all do the same thing, right? They all look the same, except their flowers are slightly different. I think the big difference is that second uh, genus has seeds that have no means of long distance dispersal. Unlike all the bromeliads that either have wings on the seeds that can blow around, or they have fleshy fruits that the birds can carry around, they're naked. And so they just fall out of the plants. And we believe the reason they've speciated so much is they, they, they disperse so little, they can uh, differentiate genetically at very small spatial scales, and that leads almost inevitably to rapid speciation. So um, now getting back to orchids. Uh, I guess I would say that um, the uh, first set of explanations I advanced involving traits, probably, I mean, the way I view it, those are selective differences that are driven uh, differences in, in, um, in speciation. So, um, you know, pollinia, right, uh, or epiphytism, uh, those things are ecologically important and reproductively important. 
On the other hand, I think that the, um, the differences associated with um, uh, differences in biogeographic distribution, like Andean taxa really speciate frequently, they might not in many cases have much to do with selection. It might have just to do with limited dispersal. And in the Andes, you might have several ridges and several valleys between them. And you can have speciation happening uh, in parallel uh, on those for no reason except the fact that the plants can't get around. So I, I suspect that they have both selection driving some differentiation, but also no selection, no, just dispersal limitation driving speciation. Does that make sense? OK, very good. Excellent question. Anyone else? Yes. We'll be here all night. Sure. Um, there's a Twitter stream this week about nocturnal moths evolved into daytime butterflies, not to avoid bats, but to get nectar. Um, and so I'm wondering if this is something that the orchid people and the moth is the left doctor. Uh, obviously, as you say, it's, it just came out this week. I still haven't absorbed its message entirely or believe it entirely. Um, and I have no idea what impact it would have on orchids. The, the, the fact of the matter is there are many uh, night flowering plants yeah. pollinated by moths. Thank you very much. So uh, the, the plants, that, pardon me, the, the lepidopteran do not have to become diurnal to get nectar. So that's why I don't believe the story. Now, it almost surely is the case, well, actually we are certain it's the case, that butterflies came from moths. That's, that's absolutely true. Most lepidopterans are moths, and you look at the, the tree of, of the lepidopterans, and uh, butterflies evolved from various moth lineages. The, the, the moths have a big problem. Uh, they're flying around in the dark, and they're major prey items for spiders. And um, one of their key defenses against spiders is being a lepidopteran. A lepidopteran means what? The uh, scale wings. So all those scales on the wings of moths are a means for the moth to escape the, the uh, adhesive strands in a, in a spider's web, right? They just pull off. Uh, but that means that if there's a transition to daylight where suddenly mates can see what's on your wings, uh, then you could have rapid evolution through s sexual selection of bright colors uh, to attract mates or to warm predators off in the butterflies. Other questions? Well, thank you all very much. <laughs>